I want us to look tonight in John chapter 8. In John 8, if I may set the scene for just a moment, in John 8, Jesus is in the seat of religion. But the interesting thing about John 8 is that he is not, he is not in John 8 the fountain of compassion that we have expected Jesus to be. In John 8, he is, he is not the Mr. Rogers Jesus that most individuals want. In John chapter 8, he is, he is confrontational Jesus, in fact. The day begins with the humiliation of a woman who is taken at adultery, and she's used as a pawn. She's used as a pawn to try to hook Jesus on the horns of a dilemma. And then it goes from bad to worse. The dialogue this day in John 8 is brutal. I want you to read with me in John 8, beginning in verse number 12. Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. The Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself and your testimony is not true. In other words, you are a liar. You are a liar. Jesus in verse 19 said, well, you neither know me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. In verse 23, he said to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I have told you that you would die in your sins for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Verse 31, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, well, you are truly my disciples and you will know truth and the truth will set you free. Verse 39, but they answered him, Abraham is our father. And in verse 41, they trot out that old rumor from 30 years ago and they say, we were not born, at least we were not born of sexual immorality. We were not, we were not born of fornication. Verse 42, Jesus said, If God were your father, you would love me. I came from God, and I am here. I came <clears throat> not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand in truth. There is no truth in him when he lies and speaks out of his own character, because he's a liar. He is the father of lies. Because I tell you the truth, you will not believe me. Which one of you can convict me of sin? If I tell you the truth, why do you not believe? Who is or whoever is of God hears the words of God? The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. In verse 48, the Jews answered him and said, Are we not correct in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and yet... You dishonor me. Drop all the way down to verse 55. But you have not known God. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know God, then I would be a liar like you. But I know him and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He was glad. And, he's, and when he saw it, he was glad. The Jews said to him, well, you're, you're not 50 years old. You're not yet 50 years old. And you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I yeah, they understood what he meant by that. And so in the next phrase, they picked up stones to throw at him. Jesus hid himself and went, and went out of the temple. When they picked up stones to throw at him, it means that they were going to stone him to death. They intended to kill him, execute him on the spot right there. It is a brutal scene. It is one that escalates from beginning to end, relentlessly so. And I think when you read that, you have to wonder, why, why didn't Jesus just leave it alone? I mean, when things began to deteriorate at the beginning where we were reading, why didn't Jesus just leave it alone and stop and say, hey, look, you know what, guys, let's just leave it right here. You know what, we, we're, we're going to see this differently, and all that really matters is that we love God and we rely on the grace of God, and so let's just not pursue this any further because it's going to put us in conflict, and so let's just leave this alone. Let's just kind of agree to disagree. But he doesn't do that, and he won't do that here because he's dealing with issues of eternal life and eternal death. If you want to sound antiquated and out of touch in 2024 America, if you want to sound naive in our culture, just talk about absolute truth. Just talk about absolute truth. Talk about something that is absolutely right or wrong. Because in American culture today, everything is up for grabs, it seems. Everything can be negotiated. Former Secretary of Education William Bennett, I heard him in a, in a, uh, in a dinner that I emceed. And he said, you know what we have in America? We have both feet firmly planted in midair. And what he meant by that was that we're, we're not standing on anything anymore. It's been commonly said for generations in America that, uh, let me get my, uh, 
All right, let's try again. All right, my guy's in the booth going to have to help me. Is it coming up? There we go. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It has been, oh, that's not working either. Let's see. There, there we go. All right. It has been commonly said in America that, that we have, for generations, we have said that there are th three types of truth, and you no doubt have heard these. On the one hand, we have, we have a blank page. We have, we have the truth that it's not there. We have, oh, uh, there we go. Okay, you're gonna. Are you guys gonna advance for me up there? All right, thank you. I'll point at you when I'm ready. All right. <clears throat> if I forget, you holler at me. All right. Okay. Good job. All right. All right. Now, oh, look at this. We got a young guy coming. God. There we go. Okay. What do we got? Oh, I know how to turn it on. Yeah, think where you are. Well, there you go. Boy thinks he's so smart, going to come up here and show up the old guy. I don't know. There you go. Yeah, there you go. I'm old. I'm not senile just yet. I'll tell you. So that in America, we've come to believe, and we've said for generations, that there are three types of truth. The first, the first is objective truth. The objective truth is what can be pro proven. It's, it is quantifiable. It is it is demonstrable. It is, there is empirical evidence for that. There is data that supports it. And so you can say, you know what? This is clearly and objectively true. This, this has been proven. But secondly, secondly, there is subjective truth. And that is what is personally true for you and what's personally true for me. And those things can be different. There are things that are true for me that would not be true for you. For example, one truth for me is I hate snakes. Absolutely loathe and despise snakes. Now, that may not be true for you. There are people I know, there are people who collect snakes. There are people who have snakes as pets. None of those people are my friends and never will be. But for me, my truth is I don't, I don't like them. You may have a different point of view about that, and that is certainly fine. And then thirdly, there is normative truth, normative truth. Normative truth is what the world generally believes is right and wrong. And so the world pretty much believes that for Mr. Putin to assassinate his political enemies is wrong. We just look at that and we say, you know, it crosses a line. It doesn't matter who you are. We understand that that is wrong. But today there has come to be really a fourth truth that sociologists will talk about, and that's complex truth. And complex truth argues that, look, truth is so individual in nature that you get to decide, even in these three areas, even in the area of objective truth, not just subjective and, and normative, but even in objective truth, you get to decide what is true for you. And so your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth. And what's amazing is we don't reason that way in any other realm of life. We don't think that way in finances. We don't think that way in medicine. We certainly don't think that way in aeronautics. Why? Well, because in finance, you will go bankrupt. In medicine, you will get sick. In aeronautics, you will die. And so we understand that there are objective truths in all of those areas that must be honored. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, it is imperative when we come to spiritual truth that we not bring those concepts, particularly that final one, into our mindset. And so that's why it's essential that we, if we go to the next slide, that's why it's essential that we respect the truth, that we respect the truth. In fact, the Bible says, Proverbs 23, that we should, <clears throat> we should buy the truth and do not sell it. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Have you thought about how much the Bible says about truth and why we need to respect it. It's because truth matters to God. Truth matters greatly to God. In fact, God is named in the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, God is named the God of all truth. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said, is the spirit of truth. And as we saw yesterday, he promised that he would guide the apostles and by extension us into all truth. That's why the Bible says that we ought to worship in spirit and in truth. In 1 Corinthians 13, rejoice in the truth and speak the truth in love, according to Ephesians 4, and wear the belt of truth in Ephesians chapter 6, and walk in the truth, 3 John in verse 3. And we have to correctly handle the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 in verse 15. Isaiah said it always, it always worked that way. Isaiah lamented in Isaiah 59 that truth is stumbled in the streets. It's nowhere to be found. Jeremiah complained that truth had perished, that it had vanished in Jeremiah 7 and 28. And Amos spoke of those who despised the truth and would not tell the unvarnished truth of God any longer at Amos 5 and verse 10. And so no wonder, 
No wonder the Bible says you need to buy the truth and sell it not. Why is that? Well, because the Bible said in Acts 20, beginning in verse 30, that sometimes men will distort the truth. In Romans 1, they will suppress the truth. Paul said in Romans 1, men will sometimes exchange the truth of God for a lie. 2 Thessalonians 2 and 10, sometimes men will refuse to believe the truth and love the truth. James 3 and verse 14 says that sometimes men will deny truth. And 1 John 1 and verse 6, sometimes men will not live in truth. And so no wonder God said, I need you to buy the truth and don't sell it. There are some things that are not up for grabs. Everything is not gray and nebulous and undefined. There are some things that are unequivocally right, and there are some things that are unequivocally wrong because God has said them clearly. Secondly, we need to respect the source of truth. So in John 18 and beginning in verse number 37, Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus, Jesus said, there we go. Jesus said, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And that's why in John 12 and 48, John 12 and 48, Jesus said, the one who rejects me and does not receive my word as one that judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge a man in the last day. And then third, we need to make sure that we respect the challenge to truth, respect the challenge of truth. And our verse for that is 2 John 1, beginning in verse 7. He said, you need to remember, he's talking to Christians, that many deceivers have gone out into the world. Please understand that John is talking there to Christians. He's not so concerned right here about people in the world who don't have a connection to Christianity. He is concerned. Look at you. You are so good. You're my favorite young preacher. So, it didn't work. Jordan. I'm not making it up. Oh, there it worked. Okay, there we go. All right, there you go. Okay, you can go sit down. Uh, uh, Jordan, it's not working again. No, I'm sorry, I'm just messing with you now. So John says, look, there are many deceivers that have gone out into the world. And he's not, he's not talking about individuals in the world that he's concerned about who don't have a connection to Christianity. He's worried, about, he's worried about those who would find an audience with Christians and yet don't deal with the truth the way that we have just, that we have just spoken. Okay, I'm not kidding now. It's not working. So you, you're going to have to advance it up there for me. All right, guys, you're going to have to advance it for me up there. Okay? Okay, go ahead. There you go. So in the next verse, here's what he says. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but you may win a full reward. And so he's talking to Christians, and he said, look, here's the challenge, the truth. You're going to have to be discerning about this because I don't want you to lose your reward. The truth and believing things that are not true can cause you ultimately to lose your reward. And then one other thing along this line. Next, we, we, we're get, we need to respect the warnings about truth. And what I mean by that is we've got to be real careful that we don't believe that some of the warnings that are issued in the Bible about truth and what individuals do to that, we've got to be careful that we don't believe that they are written in invisible ink. We've got, to, we've got to understand that these warnings are still true. The warning of Jesus, for example, in Matthew, in Matthew 7 and verse 15, when Jesus said, I want you to be careful because there will be wolves in sheep's clothing. Have you ever wondered how a wolf got sheep's clothing? The answer is he killed a sheep. He came in among the sheep and he killed it. And so he's wearing the clothes to disguise himself. And so we've got to recognize that warning. The warning of Peter, and of Paul rather, in Acts 20, beginning verse 29. And he says to these elders, look, take heed to yourself and to all the flock over the which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Because he said, I know, I know that once I'm gone, there are going to be ravenous wolves that were entered among you, not sparing the flock. And so you've got to be careful about that. And then the warning of Peter, Peter in 2 Peter 1, when he said, look, there were false prophets among the people, and there are going to be false teachers among you as well. And then finally, the warning of John, the warning of John in 1 John 4 and verse 1. When he said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And then one other thing. We need to respect, finally, the responsibility to the truth. And the responsibility to the truth is multifaceted. I think it is that we have to be discerning. That is, we need to take whatever we hear, and we need to hold it next to the plumb line of God's Word and make sure that they, that they dovetail together. And we need to be supportive. We need to be supportive of those who preach and teach truth and encouraging of those individuals. And we need to be studious. Give diligence to show yourself approved to God. Paul said to his protege Timothy, a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed. How do you do that? 
by handling or right the word of truth. Make sure that you're handling the word of truth correctly, and then you need to be courageous. We need to make sure, be strong, as Tim led us a moment ago, be strong and courageous about so many things as a Christian, but especially when it comes to honoring and paying attention to the truth that comes from God. And so the question then is, is there a truth that is always true? That regardless of circumstance or preferences, there's a truth that's just always true. Well, Jesus thinks there is. Clearly in John 8, he is, he is arguing and he's saying, no, you know, here, here is what is right and what is true. And he won't let go of that. He doesn't let go of that. So for our purposes this evening, what I'd like to do is just talk to you about three types of truth. And then Jesus' very famous statement about truth in John chapter 8. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And so, if you'll advance to the next slide, at the CIA headquarters in Langley, <clears throat> Virginia, there is a wall. You can't hardly read the words. Can you read those words at all? When you go into Langley, <clears throat> on the right side, there's a little cove. And this wall in the cove, it's interesting that it's all in shadows, but there is a shaft of light that comes in, and it shines on the words. And the words are, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And it's somewhat the unofficial motto of the CIA, of all, of all people in all places. Well, what does the CIA do? Well, they collect information. They gather information. They analyze information. And then they carry out operations around the world based on that information. And it's interesting that when you walk in, this is what's on their wall. You shall know truth. Truth will make you free. Well, where did they get that? Well, they got that, of course, from Jesus. They got it from Jesus in John, in John chapter 8, if you'll advance, please. And so what we read a moment ago, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples, and you'll know truth, and truth will make you free. But there's a conditional nature to what he said. Did you notice that? And so we've underscored on the slide the word abide. He said truth will make you free, but you've got to abide in that truth. I want you to think about that with me for just a minute. It's easy to get that wrong. It's easy for us to believe somehow, some way, that once we are baptized into Christ, that we somehow just kind of punched our ticket for heaven and everything's going to be okay. But Jesus said, you know what the criteria is? That you abide in my word because then you are truly my disciples. And so baptism is really just the beginning. Now, now you've got to deal with his truth. And so we abide. Well, what does that mean? Think about, <clears throat> think about a turtle in a shell. What does a turtle do in its shell? It abides in its shell. If you see a turtle that's outside of its shell, it's not just having a bad day. It's fixing to die. Why? Because it can't survive. And a Christian who is outside the truth of God can't survive spiritually. That's what Jesus said. If you abide in my truth, then, and by ellipsis, only then, you are truly my disciples. I like this quote that I read in preparation for this lesson that said, look, there is nothing... There is nothing like the freedom we can have in Jesus. No money can buy it. No status can obtain it. No works can earn it. Nothing can match it. It is truly tragic that not every Christian experiences this freedom, which can never be found except by abiding in God's Word and being Jesus' disciple. So the question, ladies and gentlemen, to Jesus and us is, what are we doing? What are we doing with God's truth? So, if you'll advance next, here's the problem. Here's the problem with truth today. Today, truth has been segmented into three areas. Let me just mention them quickly. The first is a truth. That is what may or may not be true. It may be true, it may not be true. And so we talk about things like that. We talk about, <clears throat> we talk about politics, we talk about our nation, we talk about science or we talk about climate change or immigration or international relations and we talk about a thousand other items and what we what we believe about that may be true may not be true the fact of the matter is that we have such very very limited knowledge that it may be true it may not be true but then secondly there is my truth and this is what i believe to be true and we all use that vernacular don't we 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 all talk about things that way we say well let me tell you what i believe about that or here's what i believe about that. And it may be in a thousand different areas of life, but we, we all use that terminology because we all think that way. Well, here's, here's what I believe. Now, you know, I, I may have some questions, but here's what I've come to believe about, about that. Could it be that sometimes, ladies, could it be that sometimes 
One of the reasons why our culture is sometimes the dumpster fire that it is, is that we just, we can hardly acknowledge that, that somebody else, that they're, they're good people and honest people and smart people who may not see things exactly like we do. And it just leads to polarization in, in many ways. But we all use this terminology. This is, this is what, I, what I believe true, and we all do that. We all do that. But then there's a third category, and this is the truth, and this is what matters. This is the truth because this is what God says to be true. This is what God says to be. This is a thus saith the Lord. This is God speaking. This is Jesus saying repeatedly, what is written in the law? How do you read the law? Well, this is God's truth. Now, the challenge in 2024, of course, is that so many individuals bring those first two approaches where what may be true, it may not be true, and here's what I believe to be true. So many want to bring that to religion, to spiritual matter, and apply it there. And so in our culture, we've kind of come to a point that our culture believes, even in spiritual matters, look, that, you know, opinions and personal beliefs are so conflated with each other that really there is no truth that can be trusted, no truth that is absolute. And Jesus will have none of that. What Jesus said in John 8 was, look, you shall know truth and truth will make you free. And if you abide in my truth, then you are my disciples indeed. With that understanding that there's a truth, my truth, but the important thing is the truth, what God says. I think then there are three questions that have to be answered. Three questions that have to be answered. Here's question number one. <clears throat> question number one, is my truth always under the authority of the truth? That is, is what I believe. When I say, well, here's what I believe about that, am I making sure that, that, am I making sure that that's under the authority of the truth revealed by God? In other words, if God's truth is the truth, if God's truth is the only truth that sets us free, then we've got to make sure that it takes precedent over what I want to believe is true. Or what? Because God says, look, this is true. And so I've got to make sure that, that that truth, my truth, what I believe is always under the authority of God's truth. And I've got to make sure, ladies and gentlemen, whatever's going on in my life, whatever, whatever teaching is under, that I'm doing is under the authority, is under the authority of this book. Because that's the truth. I, uh, if you'll go to the next screen, this is, uh, this is the NASCAR Martin Truex Jr. Martin Truex Jr. Martin Truex Jr. Is a, he's a famous race car driver, NASCAR driver, drives number 19. I get asked all the time if I am related to Martin Truex Jr. And I always say, you mean my nephew, Marty? Well, <clears throat> he's not really my nephew. Uh, we, we somewhere would be twigs on the family tree together. I mean, there was only, <clears throat> to my knowledge, there was only one family of Truexes that immigrated to America. So somewhere along the line, we'd probably be twigs on the family tree, but he, he's not my nephew. But Martin Drex Jr. drives number 19. And nope, go back, please. Take, take that off. Thank you. So he, he, he drives number 19. And as you can see, his major sponsor is Bass Pro Shops. Now, he drives another circuit that has a different sponsor, but he drives in NASCAR for Bass Pro Shops. You have any idea what Bass Pro Shops pays to have that that decal on his hood and on the, on, the, on the back trunk lid and on the side like that? They pay a, they pay a total, let me make sure I get this right. They, make a to, they pay a total of $35 million per season. They pay $972,000 a race to have that decal on the hood and on the side and on the trunk. $972,000 per race. But if you look at that car in the front, now you can put that circle back, <clears throat> there's some smaller stickers. There's some little stickers there. And those are advertisers as well. Now, you can't read them because they're so small. And certainly when they're going a couple hundred miles an hour, you can't read them. But they're there, and they pay a lot for those. In fact, they pay for those stickers, they pay $100,000 per sticker, per race. Let me tell you what you're never going to see. <clears throat> you are never going to see a NASCAR where they take one of those little small stickers and put it on top of the big stick car on the hood. Why not? 
because the big sticker on the hood paid the price for the car. I want you to think about that with the truth of God. I may believe several things. I may have an idea about many things. I may have a preference about many, many things, but i got to make sure that that doesn't take any precedence over the truth that had been revealed by God because God Almighty paid the price. God Almighty paid the price. And so here's, here's the point, a truth that is what may or may not be true. And my truth, what I want to be true, can never supplant the truth that's been given by God. And so the question is, is my truth always under the authority of the truth? Because when all said and done, it doesn't matter much what Don Drewitz believes or what I want to be true. What matters is, what does God say about that? What does God say? When there's an issue, the question to be resolved, the issue is not, what is the common thought among churches of Christ? Or what does my family say about that? Or what does a college say about that? Or what does a paper say about that? The issue is, what does God's Word say, period? And so my truth must always be under the truth of God. Question number two. Question number two. Am I being set free by walking in the truth? The Jews' response to Jesus saying, well, truth will set you free. The Jews' response to that in the next verse was, <clears throat> they answered him and said, look, we're the children of Abraham. We have never been enslaved to anyone. So how is it that you will say to us that you can be set free? Yeah, you've talked about that in Bible classes. I know and heard that in sermons. That's interesting, pretty amazing. You know, you just want to say, well, hey, you know what? What about the Egyptians? What about the Babylonians? What about the Persians? What about these Roman soldiers who are walking out here? Well, what about being enslaved to all of them? But it's interesting that Jesus, Jesus doesn't deal with any of that. He doesn't chase that rabbit at all. He's, he, doesn't, he doesn't follow that trail. Here's what Jesus does. He answered them and said, look, truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who practices sin is a slave of sin. Isn't that interesting? He, he's not going to get caught up in that kind of minutia. Not going to argue with them about something that, <clears throat> you know, not going to make any difference. I mean, he cuts to the chase. And he said, you know, I'm here to seek and save people that are lost, and they're lost because of sin. And so, truly, truly, I say to you that whoever practices sin becomes a slave to sin. We know that, don't we? The sin will make you a slave. How many, how many people that you interact in your life, you see that they are enslaved to some sin? It will make you a slave to yourself. It will make you a slave to whatever your personal pension and sin is. It will make you a slave to your desires. It, it will make you a, a slave to your forbidden relationship, a slave to your pornography or to your addiction or to your lying. Sin will always enslave you. That's what Peter said. Whoever commits sin, that is, pledges and binds himself to a course of sinful behavior, becomes a slave, becomes a slave of sin. And so Jesus said, look, you've got to see truth. Truth will set you free from that. Now, the truth you've got to see in regard to sin simply is this. Number one, you've got to see how God sees that behavior. You've got to be honest enough to say, you know what, here's the truth about what God says about that behavior. It's why it's wrong, why it's out of bounds, because this is what God says about it. And then secondly, you've got to see the truth about how to be free from that. Not everybody's willing to do that. How many people, if you've ever dealt with anybody with an addiction and you're trying to help them with that, it's one of the greatest obstacles that you will ever, it's, that you will ever have. And then I want you to notice what he said. Take your Bible. Do you have your Bible? Look in John chapter 8 with me and begin reading with me in, in verse number 35. In verse 35, Jesus said, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. A Son remains forever. Interesting, isn't it? <clears throat> that in a family, the Son remains. And so when you and I, as children of God, when we accept the truth that is given by God in, re in relation to whatever it is, whatever it may be, Jesus is saying, look, you're, you're in the Father's house. The Father loves you. The Father gives His grace and mercy to you. But the Father also expects obedience from you. We sometimes lose sight of that. The Father expects obedience, just like you do as a physical father with your child. For all the love that you have for that child and the grace and mercy that you extend to that child, you expect that child to be obedient to you, don't you? It's why Jesus said in John 14 and verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's lost on so much of the world today. And then question number three. Question number three is, what truth am I known for? 
What truth am I known for? And that's an important question. Someone would ask you tonight as we kind of begin to wrap things up here. What truth are you known for? When people think about you, when people think about you, when they speak your name, what, what thought comes to mind? How do, they, how do they envision you? What is the truth about you that to them is immediately recognizable? I think sometimes people say, well, you know, I tell you what, I tell you about him. His work is his life. Yeah, I mean, his, his work just consumes his life. It's just everything in his life is his work. Or maybe somebody might say, you know what, they, they retired from their job a while back. They, they retired from their job, and it just seems like they retired from life as well, or they retired from the church as well. They just retired from everything when they retired from their job. Well, hopefully it's not that. You know, hopefully when people think about us, they would, they would say, well, you know what, I'll tell you about them. Their, their family, their family is tremendously important to them. And their work, it's very important to them. They're good, conscientious workers, and they, <clears throat> they work well. And, and this, this nation, America, America, this nation is very, very important to them, no doubt about that. And their friend relationship is extremely important to them. But I'll tell you what I know about them and all those relationships and all those areas of their life. What really does define them is that they're a Christian, that everything they do, whether it's with their family or in regard to their work life or their their, their friendship life, or whether it's in regard to their citizen life in these United States, everything they do is filtered through the Word of God Almighty. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we can have we can have a hundred different interests. We can have a hundred of those small stickers in our life, but they should never be allowed to take precedence over the Word of the One who paid the price for us. And so that's why the Bible says, through your Word, through your precepts, I gain understanding, and therefore I hate every false way. Why does this matter? Why does this matter? Well, it matters because John said, if we go one verse further than where we did a moment ago, John says, look, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ, he doesn't have God. And so it goes back to John 8. I mean, John was there. He heard Jesus say these things. We heard Jesus say, look, if you abide in my truth and you are my disciples, truly indeed, John heard that. And so when he's writing this letter, he no doubt hearkens back to that. And he says, look, everyone who goes ahead and does not abide, using the words of his master, doesn't abide in teaching Christ. He doesn't have God. But whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. And again, where did he get that? Well, he got it from John 8 and verse 32. If you go back, next slide, please. If you go back again, you will know the truth. You will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. So let's go back to where we began. Let's go back to where we began. And we want to end with one simple verse tonight. So John, who heard Jesus speak those words in John chapter 8, and John who clearly took all of that in, because when you read 1 John and 2 John and 3 John, you hear these themes repeated over and over and over again. So when he writes 2 John, and he just gets down to verse 3. He says this, Grace, mercy, and peace be with us. From God the Father, from Jesus Christ the Father's Son, in truth and love. And I want you to underscore in your mind, and if not there in your Bible, that last phrase, in truth and love. Because, ladies and gentlemen, those two things, the truth of God and love, are not mutually exclusive they are inseparable. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say. If we love God, we will obey God. And if we obey God, we will love others. And when we love God and obey God and obey God and love others, what does that lead to? It leads to what everybody wants. It leads to grace and mercy and peace. And the great news of the gospel is that Grace and mercy and peace can be ours, provided, provided we're abiding in God's truth, walking in God's love. So how about you tonight? You know, maybe you've come in this building tonight and you've thought for a long time, you know what, man, I need, I need, there's one, it's just not complete yet. There's something else I need to do. And maybe you know tonight that that's being buried in the water of baptism. I will tell you that we, we love you and we care about you and we want you to be right with God more than anything in the world, but we cannot change the truth of God. I can't say to you, I can't say to you about that, you know what, you're such a good person, 
I believe you'll be okay. I, I can't say that to you. What I've got to say to you is the truth of God, that he that believes and is baptized will be saved. I have to tell you what the Bible says, that baptism also now saves us. And if that's where you are tonight, then would you understand that this invitation is for you and everybody in this room is pulling for you and praying for you to be responsive to that truth and that amazing love of God so that you can have forgiveness and salvation. If that's you tonight and we can help you in a public way, please let us. Thank you for connecting with us this morning. We're so thankful that you were able to do that. If you have questions, we'd love to have the opportunity to talk to you. You can contact us at www.thebibleway.com or questions at thebibleway.com. Questions at thebibleway.com. We'd love to have you in person. Come if you can, but thank you for connecting with us.